outro cast. Thank you so much for, for doing this. Aside from having to talk to media scum, good day so far? Listen, it's a, any day that I get to talk about our record is a fantastic day. Thanks for giving me that opportunity. That's great. Before I ask about that great record, Boombox, uh, are you rich to everyone? Is it Duke? Yeah. No, nah, Rich is fine. Thanks. Okay, it's not Duke. Thanks. That's my that's my given name. So, no, no, I, I've 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 somehow feel like uh, uh, it's a fun title, but then I always get kind of weird about it when it gets casual conversation. You know. <laughs> well, Rich, uh, the new album Boombox. I was on the first two Jericho cruises, so I remember when it was called Twenty Twenty, and Nowhere to <laughs> yes. Run was the new single. Are the songs on Boombox the songs that were planned for 2020, or did you scrap some and go back to the drawing board? It was a little bit of both. So uh, it basically gave us this opportunity. It was like, uh, you know, what a lot of people tried to do it was like the, you know, lemons to lemonade scenario for a lot of us. And uh, our producer uh, had some health issues and he just said, hey, uh, I don't feel comfortable all of us collaborating in a room together. So we tried doing this and I found it to be incredibly difficult because that interpersonal connection is everything for me. It's being able to read body language and how is this and that communication. So we tried a couple of times to, uh, you know, do writing sessions and we just said, Hey, let's all work separately for a while and then we'll collaborate. Mm -hmm. once Everybody feels like we can do that. And we all had a bunch of ideas and came in. And as a result, we had a much better record because with the extra time, the other thing that people don't all often realize is that if you write an album over six months or six weeks or whatever that period of time that bands decide this is our creative period. And now we move on to the second phase, which is recording it, um, is that a lot of times in a short period of time, you may just kind of be in the same kind of bio rhythms and you end up with a lot of material that sounds super cohesive and almost too much alike. Um, mm -hmm. So having a longer period of time really gave that opportunity to all of us to have kind of a broader spectrum of emotions and experiences and things to kind of dig in. And it also gave us that chance to do what you do on a lot of books that you write, which is um, draft one, draft two, draft three. Uh, and it, it just made for a better album. It, it, it was um, who, who is to say what is better? But it, it, from my perspective, the stuff that we had early on, this was a huge improvement, and we, uh, we're, we're all really excited about it. Yeah, you make a really good point there. The first Ramones album, the first Beatles album, those are one-day affairs. And then yes. I like Chinese democracy, so sometimes it's Guilty. good. Guilty. Yeah, <laughs> love it. Yeah, Better is one of the best songs Guns N' Roses ever did. But uh, we're Agreed. here to talk about Fozzy and Boombox. and Or Guns N' Roses. I'm good. I love that band. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll saddle you with the Dave Lee Roth questions at the end. But while, yes. we're, while we're still talking about Boombox, any idea like how many songs you sculpted or, or at least demoed to get to what made the final album? I can't remember a count, but it's probably in the 20 to 25 oh. range. But, you know, the, the great thing about that is that a lot of them are carcasses. They, they, they started off as one idea and then you work on them, work on them. And then they get to mm -hmm. that point where you're like, there's some good stuff here. Let's see if we can't make something more out of it. And then you finally uh, you, you do the time of death is so and so. And then you may pilfer the carcass of the one part that you really liked and yeah. then start from scratch or use it along with this other idea. So it starts to become Frankenstein's monster a bit where you have ideas that worked, but maybe not the song itself was working. So um, and when you have time, that's the beautiful thing about it is you, you really have a chance to, to do those things. And obviously you can overthink things. Um, uh, but the good news for us was is that we had time to work on a song and come back to it four weeks later and mm -hmm. you haven't even listened to it. And then you're like, whoa, I thought that was good when we left it. This is really terrible. And you, you get some perspective because that's always uh, a good place, to, whether it's if you're a painter or, you know, a chef, whatever. It's always nice to be able to have a chance to kind of step away from something, come back to it and see if it was as great as you thought it was. Well said. Well, Fozzie, at this point, given the long-term success, it's eclipsed any amount of 
okay, what I'm trying to say is no one can go, that's Chris and the guy from Stuck Mojo's band. Like you're so beyond that in terms of your success has arguably eclipsed all the old claim to fames. I'm curious when you figured out of, hey, this is no longer a, a band featuring, but actually a band that has a true fan base. Probably 2005 was the first time that we decided that we would stop putting featuring WWE superstar Chris Jericho on things, you know, because uh, when we first started off, it was, you know, Fozzering, Fozzie featuring WWE, oh, at the time, WCW superstar Chris Jericho and uh, and members of Fozzie. Then, I'm excuse me, I've stuck Mojo. Yeah. And then, it, it this as time went on, we just we always told promoters, hey, say whatever you have to do to get people in the door. You yeah. know, Fozzie's a new uh, property or a new idea. So if you have to say, if we're playing an area that stuck Mojo did big tickets and you feel like it helps to put that on the featuring that kind of thing, then do it. And then we just got to the point where we said, I don't think we need to. Um, and Chris, a long time for people to accept Chris as uh, the frontman of a rock band and not uh, Chris, the, the professional wrestler who also has a side band that he does for fun. Because obviously he does it for fun, but this is a true passion. Anybody who knows Chris or has been around him or the fact that he's been in this band for 23 years. Yeah, this is. Yeah, it, it, he has he has put in the time for the rock and metal community to finally say. He's the real deal. This is not a vanity project. And at some point, uh, we either proved ourselves to the fans and earned that respect of them just calling us Fozzy, or um, they, they can still say to their friends, I love this band, Fozzy. You know, the guy that is with AEW, the wrestler guy, Chris Jericho, do you know him? Sometimes it's just, it's the same thing with them. Um, and I always, always, it's strange sometimes to say, but it's like someone goes, hey, have you ever heard of Slipknot before? And they're like, ah, Slip. Like, if you're not into the heavy metal community, you go, yeah, you right. may have seen them. They're the band that wears the masks. It's like, oh, I've, I've seen pictures of them. Sometimes you just have to go with, you know, same with my mom with Kiss. Is that the band that does the face paint? Like, you know what I mean? Sometimes it, it helps to just give some yeah. some ground rules of where to start. Ground. And, uh, <laughs> it, that, that's going to be a new Fozzie single in the near future. Ground rules. And you're welcome. Uh, I'm ground rules. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> and one other thing I'm curious about with Fozzie is as somebody who's worked in the music industry, I know that there's not just one way to write a song. And I was curious when you collaborate with Johnny Andrews or an outside person, is it that you're bringing a, a mostly demoed thing and then one guy's the vibes guy in the room to edit it? Or like, in other words, are you bringing a mostly written song to the table or do you actually write from scratch in the room? We've done it both ways. I find the writing from scratch thing is the worst way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's always nice to come in with a riff or a lyric or just a starting point, an idea, a concept, uh, a, a vibe. Even if it's, you know, hey, we did this on an earlier record and I really liked what we were doing. I think we can really expand off of this groove and and reimagine how that would be in 2022. So it can look a lot of different ways. The, the scratch thing is rough because then you're like, all right. And then there's a guy with an acoustic guitar and a guy on a piano. And then we're, there's a lot of time looking at each other and quiet because some guy plays a riff and an idea. And then the other guy is staring at the other. At like, it's just this weird I, I, I don't like it. I prefer just to come in with the starting point, like I said. Um, and then at least it gives us, even if the starting point is something that we don't even use, it's discarded. It's that it's a, it says, this is where we should, this is a nucleus of an idea. This is the Genesis, whatever. And Johnny and I have now been working together for five years and I love him. He's a genius. He's made us a, a better band and a better uh, uh, songwriting unit. And where, where Johnny really excels is, is that Johnny is a true artist. Chris and I are rock and roll guys. We're, it's all about freaking vibe and this and this. And Johnny is the kind of guy who will say he will labor over every word. 
And I like that because Chris and I are not, we don't labor over words. Yeah, you're you know, first it's kind draft. of like, yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot of times <laughs> it is just a first draft. It's an idea. Yeah. And Johnny is, uh, no, it's not good enough. Let's keep working. Let's keep mining it. And he also is good about, that seems a bit stock to me. You know, yeah, I think we've overused the word pain. Like, like we, there are other ways to say this in a way that is creative. And I love that, that we have an outside person that can push us without us having that inner personal stuff. Because before it was a lot of Chris and I being the nucleus of it. And then it's two guys having to decide whose ideas are right. And that caused a lot of strain on our friendship and our relationship because, you know, we didn't have a referee. He was like, Point Ward or Point Jericho. <laughs> now we actually have the person that's in charge. He's the producer. Mm -hmm. And we got the idea from all of our heroes, all the documentaries with Bob Rock, with Mutt Lang, Rick Rubin, all of these people who come into these bands who have a working process in place. Because Fozzie had a process. And we, we did the same thing for 15 years. And all of a sudden, we're bringing in a producer who's a keyboard player. Mm -hmm. You know, and when you're a heavy metal guy, a keyboard, you're you're doing a lot of this thing about the keyboard player. You know, like, you know, the only keyboard player I know who was cool was Claude Schnell, who played for Dio. Like, and only because he had the best mustache ever. And he played the keyboard part in Rainbow in the Dark. And we all, our 16-year-old selves loved that. No, but besides come on, that, Don Airy, John oh, Lord. Oh, thank you. Don Lord, yes, of yeah, course. Come on. Yeah, you, yes. Yeah, the, Don Airy was from the Europe. Yes. Come on. The guy from Europe. You know, uh, hey. The guy from Europe. You don't know his name. Neither do I. I got well, It was name. written by Joey Tempest. Uh, the, all the okay. publishing on the final countdown goes to Joey Tempest, but I can't remember the guy from, from that band's name. I mean, in TNT, we had Dog Stoke. Uh, Woo! You went deep. You went deep. I only then, know Ronnie Lee Tecro. Yeah. And, and I'm interviewing Ronnie next week, and I used to be on yes. uh, the TNT's management team. But uh, Brett Tuggle, come on. Brett Tuggle from the David Lee Roth band. Okay. You see, see, you're going super deep on me now. See, you're a journalist. You know everybody. Yeah, I'm I'm a guitar player. I can name the guy. I know the guy who played guitar on that thing. But and that's true, Don Airy was the guy. Like I, I actually we stayed in the same hotel when Don was on tour with uh, White Snake, and I saw him come through the lobby and I was like, there's Don Airy. So yeah, it was the same thing, except for this one was positive as opposed to the he's the keyboard player. Yeah. I remember the first time I saw Striper live, I was lucky enough that a friend that got me backstage. They had two keyboard players, one that played all of the piano and synth stuff, and the other guy that played all the samples. In God we trust, oh, oh yeah. trust. <laughs> yeah, before everything was on tape. We, uh, people always like bag on, oh, everybody's on tracks. It's like everybody always did it. It was just they had keyboard players playing samples before. This The technique changed. If you don't think that – uh, Queen was running samples. Everybody did. It was part of yeah, being for a rock band. Rhapsody, they had to do of the, course. the vocals. Yeah. Everybody did those things. As a matter of fact, I remember I watched um uh I was watching uh 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 Too Much Time on My Hands by uh, Sticks, Sticks a yeah. live thing, and it was it was tracks. It's yeah. like you like bands who make very ambitious studio albums. There, you have to figure out a way to do it. Same thing like when you go see that Stevie Nicks song, um, Stand Back, ba -ba 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 yeah. that arpeggiated part. It's, it's, it's got to be played to in time. If the keyboard player is just playing the arpeggio, the band's going to get off and you're a mess. But uh, So I digress. The keyboard player was much more important 30 years ago when they were covering a lot of bases. Well, two quick questions and then you're a free man. And the first no, one, I don't want to be free. We're best friends. We need to get an apartment together. <laughs> <laughs> well, first thing I was curious about is everyone was talking about the music video that you filmed on the roller coaster. But I was curious if you ever saw a music video by the band Long Wave called Tidal Wave. And uh, they were an RCA band where they filmed a music video on a roller coaster. No, I never saw. It. That's really cool. I'll check it out. How was it? Oh, uh, they did not vomit on on screen or anything like some of you guys did. Yeah, we, we were going to put the uh, the disclaimer, if, you, if you're if you prone to vomiting when other people vomit, don't watch our video. It was crazy. The, the, the truth about that was is that all of us are roller coaster enthusiasts, and none of us have motion sickness issues that we thought would manifest itself. We thought we got this. 
problem was is that most of the roller coasters that we've ridden in the past are the ones that are a minute or a minute and a half per ride. Mm -hmm. This was the longest wooden roller coaster in the world. So it's two minutes and 48 seconds. What we didn't take in consideration is, is that on most roller coasters, it's a blast. You get off. You wait in line again. You got 10 minutes to reset or however the long however the line is. We did the two hours and of two minutes and 45 seconds and reloaded and got right back on. And we just didn't know how our bodies were going to react to those many G forces and just going through that process without having the, uh, the, the, the rest between sets, so to speak. And it's, yeah, it bit us. It got oh, all of sure. us. Uh, Jericho was the guy who was the best trooper. He was like, it got him the last or the, he was the last guy to go, uncle, we're done. <laughs> That's it. Wow. So never again. Uh, and, the last thing I want to know, speaking of Jericho, is, is he the biggest fan of David Lee Roth in Fozzie, or is that you? No, it's him. Yeah, for sure. Because uh, although I'm a huge David Lee Roth fan, I can also make the argument that Sammy Hagar deserves a spot right next to David Lee Roth. Like, I'm a big fan of both eras. Like, And, and part of the reason is because is they're completely different. It's the same reason why, uh, you know, I like – both versions. I love the Killers and First Iron Maiden record. I, I love Paul Diano and I love Bruce. I, I'm not saying the either one. They're just so different. Um, but Chris is a diehard David E. Roth, no ifs, ands, or buts. And um, but I, yeah, I mean, if you had if gun to the head, I think David Lee Roth is the best front man that rock and roll has ever seen. Uh, and I think you could easily make that argument. Uh, and I and I think Bruce Dickinson is in the argument in the top five. And I think because there's those people who they're just it's there's five incredible or four incredible musicians, but you can't stop looking at the one person. That's mm -hmm. when, you know, I did a band called Adrenaline Mob for oh, yeah. like a year. And um, and I I consider myself in, uh, an A-list or entertainer on guitar. Like I've I grew up with my heroes. Were, it's, it's the BDP yoga, our mutual friend Dallas. That yes, uh, that it is wizardry. Yes, and all, I love I love <laughs> Flea. I love these people that when you see it, it's like you're watching just chaos in the form of a musician. Sure. And when I was in Adrenaline Mob, it was almost as if I was invisible. They were looking at Mike Portnoy the whole time. It didn't matter how crazy I went or what I did. It was like I was a screen door <laughs> was looking straight to Mike. And I just realized there are people that just have a gravitational pull that are just such a special artist, not just musically, but just just what their are, what they bring to the performance. That's so powerful that, you know, of course, people are I got some peripheral vision love. But when it came down to it, it's the same thing. It's like I think Steve Harris is an incredibly Ma you know, magnetic entertainer, and and he's such an incredible force of nature. But he's on stage with Bruce Dickinson, and mm -hmm. it's it's un and it's the same with Eddie Van Halen. It's hard to say a, a guitar player that had more charisma and had more magnetism, except for he's standing next to David Lee Roth, <laughs> and it's and it's unfair for those of us who consider ourselves, you know, same with Slash. Slash is an apex predator, and he's next to the apex predator, Axl Rose. And it's the same thing with me and Fozzie. Again, I'm standing next to Chris Jericho. He, he's one of the best frontmen in, in whatever he does. He's incredible. And, uh, and so you start to learn your role is like, hey, there's nothing wrong with being the number two guy. Randy Rhodes was the number two guy. Hey, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, he stood next to Ozzy. It's like he's always going to be a number two guy, but it's but you start to learn like in every band, there's a pecking order and where is your place? And that's what makes a great band. Not everybody can be the quarterback. Not everybody can be the pitcher. You, a great team learns where everyone's position lie and they learn to accept that position and be the best they can at it. Mm -hmm. And if it's a sub, like there's a lot of supporting actors and actresses, they can't all be Tom Cruise. They can't all be the rock, but if you're amazing supporting cast, it makes it makes the movie better. And I think that's that's the lesson in life is that um, uh, if, when David Lee Ross on stage, your, your best role you're going to find is number two. <laughs> well, I appreciate that insight. And I look forward to the eventual Fozzie single called Ground Rules. But 
Thank you for the time. Thank you for the great year. You're, you're getting a co-write. You're getting a co-write. We're gonna have to work this the out room. with your publisher. You certainly and saw it. That hey, if you're if you know anything about songwriting, if yes. you're in the room, you're getting a cut. You're either in the room or change a word, get a third. So I'm gonna. Ooh, I'm gonna I don't know it. that one. Let's keep that on the down low because I don't want anyone knowing that rule. <laughs> change two words, get the, well, whatever it is. Rich. <laughs> get two thirds. Yes. <laughs> I hate these rules. <laughs> well, best of luck. Thank you Thank for your you. time and looking forward to hey, it. Was, you come in. It was a real privilege speaking with you. Thanks for your time today. I love the shirt. Judas Priest, my, my favorite 80s metal band of all time. I can't tell you played keyboards, but Bye, whatever man. it was, it was great. <laughs> Thanks, it was a Don Airy or Claude Schnell, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Thanks, Peace man. out. Thanks, brother. Outro cast.